Here on the Spectra Creative Channel, we've managed to crank out a video per day, pretty much since we started. Uh, you know, occasionally even two videos a day. And now that we have such a large video library, I'm always looking for new topics to talk about. But I will tell you, based on the comment section, there is one question that comes up over and over again, and that's still about tooling, the uh, molds used to make toys, action figures, dolls, rubber duckies, that whole thing. And I get specific questions about tooling. For example, Dimitron asked what happens to characters that share a tool that are on the same sprue, but they're not used for the character. All right, well, let's jump in and answer that. What Dimitron is talking about is when you have a tool that has a figure, but you need to use part of another figure, another tool. So this is an example of an at-market product that Hasbro did a few years ago, just as a visual illustration. It's called Mashers. And yes, I mean, kids could smash them together in Doinky Doink play, but they could also pull them apart. And they could mix and match pieces. And just like this toy had a mix and match feature feature, well, that's how a lot of action figures are made. An arm from one character might be used from another. The head, body, different parts from different figures are often combined to create a final figure. Some figures are fully tooled and all the parts are in the same tool, the same mold. But sometimes a figure needs to borrow different parts from different existing tools. So what the question is, is how does this work? So let's look at a few in-industry examples. And I always like to pull examples I worked on. So this is the Masters of the Universe Classic line. And just like the vintage He-Man line, it was made up originally of common bucks or common body types. So you had the human buck, which was He-Man and Man-at-Arms. You had the beastie buck, which was Merman and Skeletor. I'm sorry, the reptile buck. And then the beastie buck, which was uh, Stratos and Beastman. So just like that, in the Classics line, we did the same thing. So here's Beastman, and again, his buck, the Beastie Buck, gets reused for various characters, like Grizzlor here. Granted, you can only see the arms and legs, but same thing. Carnivus also used the Beastie Buck, meaning the arms, legs, and torso. New head, new armor, but the basic body underneath. So you can see without the armor, he has Beastman's body there, the furry body, if you will. Other characters use different parts, like Zodak here used the beastie chest, but the human arms and legs. See, you can see he has a very uh, manly, hairy chest there, uh, which is exactly how the vintage figure was. We didn't just give him a hairy chest for, you know, funsies. He really did, he was constructed this way in the vintage line. So you can see how different bucks can be combined. And when you do this, or when you have a figure like this trio here that have the same head, but are constructed of different parts for their body, you have parts from Hero, parts from Cyclone, parts from He-Man. So creating different characters using parts that are tooled with other characters does create a logistical issue. So the question is very much legit. So how exactly is this accomplished? So it's done in the plastic injection molding phase of an action figure, and just as review, all things made of plastic are done using a large steel mold, kind of like those old Play-Doh molds we had as a kid. And when you squirt hot plastic into the mold, it's going to leave a little extra. So this is called the sprue. It's basically the center piece, and it usually runs out from the center as a line, like a tree, and connects all the pieces together. So they're all made of the same piece of plastic. You can see this army man here. So here he is out of his mold, and the little bits of the sprue are still attached. You'll see this a lot in model kits, but this is how all action figures are created. We just don't see this in the final product because all the pieces are removed from the sprue. Uh, that's part of the assembly. That's why labor costs so much, because you're having to assemble a figure. All right, so we have two different figures here, right? And they both use the same loincloth piece. So how do we do that when the loincloth is tooled with one figure, but now it's going to get reused on another? Well, it basically, it's all about cavities and understanding how cavities work. No, I don't mean like, you know, cavities in your teeth. Obviously, that's a bad thing, and we want to fight those cavities. What I mean are the cavities inside of the mold. These are also called cavities. And essentially, if you have more than one tool being used, you will block the cavities that are not being used. Now, this is more expensive, and it does add to the overall logistical expense of making a figure. The more tools that are needed, and you may have to block off more cavities, the more expensive it is. It's very much like damming a river, except less river and less dam, and more like a small piece of metal blocking plastic from flowing into other parts of the mold to block out the parts that you don't want to make. 
So that answers the original question of what do we do with those parts? Well, those parts are never made. Uh, but it is more expensive because you're having to pull multiple tools now to make one figure, which means the cost, the labor cost, the worker cost is going up because multiple tools are being used for the same figure, as opposed to if it's a fully tooled figure in one mold. This is why in the Masters of the Universe classic weapon packs, we had to maximize the number of tools you'd, or rather minimize the number of tools. So in this pack as an example, it has some accessories that are, were originally released with Tila. And since we had the bird and the armor, we basically had to use every piece that came with Tila. Her staff, her shield, etc. Alright, so that's how we avoid having extra parts. But to understand the second question, which I actually unfortunately don't have the screenshot to, is what's the difference between a sculpt and a tool? So a sculpt is done by hand. Well, actually, it doesn't have to be done by hand. It could also be done by computer. But a sculpt is not an action figure. It looks like an action figure. It smells like an action figure. It tastes like an action... F oh, God, don't taste a mold. Don't taste a, a sculpt. No, don't. But it, do it doesn't articulate like an action figure, and that's the key. So the reason I showed Mighty Spectre here is because the horseman gave me a Mighty Spectre uh, statue, if you will, that was made in the same way as the original prototype. So he looks just like he would articulate and you could pose him, but you can't because he's held together by pegs, not by joints. So here I've separated one of the legs from the uh, lower leg there, and you can see the metal rod that runs through each piece holding it together. You can't pose him or he would fall apart. He's very brittle, very fragile. He lives in my wife's china cabinet. Don't tell her. So that's the difference between a sculpt and a tool. A sculpt looks like an action figure, but it's not articulated. It's not made of plastic, and it doesn't function. Now, you can sculpt something digitally, and this is a big advantage in modern toy making because when you sculpt digitally, you can also sculpt in the articulation points and figure out how it's going to be assembled, where there's ball joints, where there's T-joints, and this is going to help in the engineering process. If it's a hand sculpt, that has to then be done as a separate step, figuring out how to break down the sculpt into an articulated figure made up of different parts that all have to get tooled with the connectors on them. So... First the sculpt is done, and then a plastic copy is made of that sculpt. And it's this plastic copy that is used to design the actual tool. First it has to be engineered, as I noted, and figure out all the articulation points so that when it comes out of the mold, out of the tool, it can actually assemble. So here you can see an original sculpt of Leia, and then the tooling model, and then the final figure. How the tooling model has to be engineered. Alright, so how is a tool actually made? Well, they're constructed through two main methods, standard machining and electric discharge machining. It's essentially where a prominent means of creating a more complex and accurate mold is needed. A computer will scan the original sculpt and then carve out the mold out of the steel. And it has to be done with steel because the mold, the tool, has to be able to withstand a huge amount of plastic being injected into it and it has to be able to be used tens if not hundreds of thousands of times. So essentially that plastic copy of the original sculpt is used by the computer to then direct the drilling machine, or sometimes by hand, to create the mold. That's why they're so expensive, because they have to be made each time unique, and they have to be made out of steel. And it's very expensive to do this, because... I know this is, you know, hot liquid gold here being poured into a mold, but it's the same concept. Just think of it as plastic. You're going to be pouring this into the steel mold over and over and over again. Same thing with, like, if you were pouring chocolate. But with hot plastic, it has to make sure the mold is durable and can last, so you could make thousands and thousands of action figures. That's what's great about steel. It has an incredible structural strength. I'm not going to get into the molecular issues, but... That's why you have to use steel for molds. It's why steel is used to construct things like buildings, because it's so stable and it can absorb huge amounts of weight or rather huge amounts of use and reuse over and over again in the case of a steel injection molding tool. It's pretty much why we see very few toy tools made out of hay or made out of sticks, because, well, it would just blow over and you wouldn't get to use them at all. And that's why tools are so expensive how they're made, and what the difference is between a tool and a sculpt. I hope this video was enlightening on some of the remaining questions about tooling. Leave your comments below. If I missed anything, I'll make another follow-up video. I love doing that. I love hearing comments. Share, like, 
subscribe, all that stuff. It helps the algorithm, and it's most appreciated. It helps YouTube share this video with others. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.